All right, hello, hello, and welcome to a video where I'm going to try and model how to answer multiple choice questions on a VC economics exam. What we're going to do, I've got all the questions from the 2018 VC economics exam. I haven't really looked at them. I've done them all before because I'm an economics teacher and multiple choice questions become my life at this time of the year, but I haven't looked at them in at least 12 months. And I'm going to try and answer them one by one and just kind of show my process of how I'd go about answering them, how I rule out answers, how I get to the correct answer. Some of them will be quicker than others. I'll try and scribble alongside what I'm doing and talk through my thought process throughout them. Just to kind of give you an idea, I know a lot of students struggle with the multiple choice in VC economics, and this way you can feel more confident in how you are going about answering them, hopefully by employing some of my techniques. So let's get straight into question one with it. So question one, relatively easy by comparison. The type of unemployment caused by technological change is known as, well, we can rule out cyclical unemployment because that's AD focused and technological change is an aggregate supply side factor. So we can rule out A. Frictional unemployment is the time spent between jobs. So that's not that one either. Structural unemployment can be caused by businesses, cost cutting, employing technology, um, closing, etc. So that is a very, very good option. So it could be that one. Hardcore unemployment is when people become discouraged um, from applying for jobs. So we know it's C from just doing those things very quickly. So C becomes the correct answer, structural unemployment. Question two, expansionary monetary policy is most likely to cause what? So when there's expansionary monetary policy, this means a decreased cash rate or interest rates. And then so what's that, what that's going to do? So a decrease in welfare payments. So if there's a decreased cash rate, technically that means that there'll be increased aggregate demand and more, and a decrease in unemployment. So that's technically potentially true. So that could have potential. An appreciation in the Australian dollar, well, if we decrease the um, cash rate, foreign investors are gonna take their funds out of Australian financial institutions looking for better returns elsewhere. So that's gonna cause a depreciation of the Australian dollar. So we can rule that out. A reduction in the rate of economic growth, you'd hope not because we're trying to stimulate aggregate demand. So we can rule that out. An increase in the size of the budget deficit, well, we can rule that out too because it should be stimulating the economy, which means it's gonna be more tax revenue and less welfare payments or transfer payments. So we can rule that out too. It ends up being A, a decrease in welfare payments because that decrease in unemployment. Question three, something about questions like this really hurt my brain. I don't know why when there's a diagram with a lot of letters on it, it upsets me, but um, I'm gonna get it right this time and many other times I've done it before. But a health warning stating that wearing a hat reduces skin cancer would likely to change the equilibrium in the hat market. Um, showing the diagram above from point A to what? So in this situation, stating that hat, wearing a hat reduces skin cancer, that's gonna be a demand side factor because that's basically advertising. So that's gonna be favorable for demand. So demand would shift from D0 to D1. What's gonna happen is in the short term, you're gonna to move to point H where more is demanded at the same price, but that is going to cause a shortage. People are gonna bid up prices until you hit point B where a new equilibrium is formed. So that is going to be a, which is B, is going to be the answer. All right, so that one's pretty, not too bad. Uh, question four, which of the following policy initiatives is likely, least likely, we're going to highlight least likely, because we want that to be important, least likely to increase aggregate supply in the economy. Once get to questions like this, I really like to highlight these points because it's really, really important. So which of these won't increase aggregate supply? Also could just be asking which one is likely to decrease aggregate supply. And that would mean the same thing. Um, so which one of these isn't going to increase aggregate supply? So an increased government spending on infrastructure, well, that would increase aggregate supply. Government spending on education training would increase aggregate supply. Um, increased government outlays to the payment of unemployment benefits. Well, people wouldn't want to work then. So that would decrease our productive capacity and decrease aggregate supply. Reduction in company tax rates that would lead to businesses having lower cost of production and increasing aggregate supply. So it's C increased government outlays. The payment of dividends to overseas shareholders will appear in the balance of payments as, well, this is um, in the current account. So we can already rule out two questions, two of these, because it's not investment, it's not migration capital coming in. So you can rule out A and B because not to do with the capital and financial account. So then it, this is a payment of dividends to overseas shareholders. So that money is going from Australia. Um, I don't know why I drew Australia like that. Australia should be more like, it's kind of Australia with a dot there. That's going from Australia to overseas. So it's money leaving Australia. So I'll make that a dollar. Um, leaving Australia, 
So credits when money's coming in, debits when money's going out. So that ends up being D, a debit in the balance of current account. Question six, an increase in productivity is likely to. So if we increase productivity, we are getting more output per unit of input. And so what that means is um, that's going to lower our cost of production. So it's going to be a decrease cost of production. And we're going to be more internationally competitive because we have a lowered cost of production. So we can rule out one and two or an A and B because it's not going to do those things. So if we have a lower cost of production as well, lower prices should be passed on. There's going to be less cost inflationary pressure. So it's not going to increase inflation either. So we can get it down to it is D, improve Australia's international competitiveness and decrease inflation. Question seven, referring to the following aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram, which of the following is most likely to cause the shift in the aggregate supply curve from AS1 to AS2? We can see here that it moves in an unfavorable direction. So we need to pick something that is unfavorable for aggregate supply. So unfavorable for um, aggregate supply, let's have a look at these. So decrease in interest rates, that would be favorable for aggregate supply. So we can rule that out. An increase in production costs, well, that is bad for aggregate supply. So that's a good chance there. An increase in government spending, well, that is technically AD focused. And even for aggregate supply, if that's on infrastructure, that's going to be good for aggregate supply. An increase in the profitability of businesses would also be good for aggregate supply because they'd invest and expand. They would want to increase their productive capacity. Therefore, B is the only one that's going to be negative for aggregate supply and increase in production costs. Question eight, consider the following data for an economy over a two year period. The prices given reflect the average for the relevant year. This is the terms of trade. So the terms of trade here from year one to year two, year one, it basically equals one because it's exactly over. Whereas this one is more, uh, ends up being, I think it ends up being worth 0.8. Um, don't quote me on that, but it ends up being around that. It's essentially just over three quarters. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is 0.8. Um, so what can we say about the terms of trade in this period? Well, the export price index has fallen and the import price index has risen. Either way, the terms of trade has uh, moved unfavorably or decreased. So it hasn't improved and it definitely hasn't remained unchanged. It can be determined because we have that data. So it has to be B, between year one and year two, the terms of trade has deteriorated. Question nine, which of the following would reduce the size of the government's budget deficit? Um, so we've got company tax cuts, personal income tax cuts, increasing the goods and services tax and increasing the tax-free threshold. So reduce the size of the government's budget deficit. What's that asking? It's saying what's going to get more revenues or less outlays? That's what we need to work out. So if there's company tax cuts, that's going to be less revenues. So we can rule that out. Personal tax cut, income tax cuts, exactly the same. Increasing the rate of goods and services tax, that's going to improve revenues. So that's potentially the answer. And increasing the tax-free threshold is going to mean less revenue. So in all these, we can rule it out until we get to C. That's the only one that's going to get more tax coming through. Question 10. The degree of price elasticity of demand is important to produce because it re reveals how. Well, this is just asking for a definitional type thing. So the price elasticity of demand is how responsive quantity demanded is to a change in price. So A is literally the definition. We'll look at the other options just because we need to make sure. So uh, how much of the product will be supplied at different prices and eh, not great of a definition. Responsive demand is to advertising, not really. Um, responsive quantity demand is to a change in income, not really also. That's the A is the only one that's really indicative of the definition. Question 11, which one of the following is not a feature of a perfectly competitive market? So let's have a look. So um, firms have ease of entry and exit, that is a feature. Homogenous products, yep, no product differentiation, that is one. Consumer sovereignty does exist. Resources are mobile, so that is not a feature because um, businesses can change what they're doing based on changing needs and wants of consumers. Question 12, when the economy is experiencing low rates of inflation and low rates of economic growth and employment growth, so this is basically saying below goals, below goal, below goal. Um, so that's basically saying the economy is not in the places we want it to be. So you want to stimulate the economy. The Reserve Bank of Australia is going to what? So we're only going to decrease the cash rate. So suddenly we've only got um, two options that make sense there. We can rule out another two. And then when the RBA wants to decrease the cash rate, what do they do? Well, they buy government securities because that's going to increase the amount of money in the short-term money market. 
which will put downward pressure on the cash rate. So that means they're going to purchase government securities and not sell them, because selling them takes the money out of the short-term money market. So D ends up being the correct answer. Question 13. Imagine the government's budget is in surplus. If the rate of economic growth were to slow, this may ultimately result in a certain so surplus. If economic growth is slowing down, that means <laughs> that revenues is going to fall or receipts are going to fall and outlays are likely to rise. So let's have a look at these answers here. So smaller budget, surplus budget as receipts rise and outlays fall, well receipts are going to fall because they're going to be receiving less tax. A budget deficit as receipts rise and outlays fall, once again, we know that's not true. A larger surplus is not going to happen because they're going to be receiving less um, revenues and having more outlays. So a smaller budget, surplus budget is the correct answer. Two to go. This question was really poorly done on the year that it was on. So let's have a talk through it and why it's the answer that it is. Question 14, which of the following would be the most likely to in, would be the most likely impact of an increase in inflation in the US? So there's high inflation in the US. So that means relatively there's more inflation in the US than Australia. Um, so if there's high rates of inflation, what do the RBA tend to do in whatever country? Well, they're likely to increase interest rates. So one of these are going to be likely because they want to slow the inflationary pressure. And what is going to happen in terms of the Australian dollar? Well, um, essentially, they're going to increase um, interest rates in the US. And is the Australian dollar going to appreciate or depreciate? Well, if they increase interest rates in the US, people are likely to withdraw funds from Australian banks and invest in US banks. So it's likely to depreciate the Australian dollar. It's going to create um, a higher, um, basically, amount of Australian dollars on the foreign exchange market and therefore depreciate the Australian dollar overall. Then we've got the last question. Uh, the following table indicates quarterly consumer price index outcomes for a hypothetical economy. Um, with, and so they're giving you a lot of data here. With reference to the table, the annual inflation rate for the year ended June 2018 is what? So June 2018 is here, June 2017 is here. We can ignore all this data in the middle. So what we care about is year two and year one. And that's all we need for our figure is because we're going to do year two minus year one over year one times 100. So that's going to equal 121 minus 110 over 110 times 100, which is going to equal 11 over 110 times 100, which ends up equaling 10%. Because so 11 over 110 is 10% of it. So that ends up being C. A lot of people picked 11% because they saw so many 11s. And that is the end of the 2018 VCAR exam. 15 questions. We just did all the answers in 13 minutes. Thank you for watching this. If this was helpful, let me know. If there's any um, exam revision type content you want, let me know and I'll help you out the best I can. I also have a lot of blogs on my website, therunningeconomy.com, where that will help you with exam revision. I'm planning to make a video closer to mid towards the end of um, October about all the current um, policies, data, etc., to make it as up to date and relevant for the exam as possible. Um, other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time. Bye.